and uh, please do let me know you know if there's anything that you know you want to uh, scratch from the record or if there's any issues but yes yeah, so we're recording so that we can uh, share the meeting for those who aren't able to join us it's always difficult trying to work out the best time to uh, schedule this and we're trying to rotate it around a little bit so that different people can join if they have unavoidable uh, clashes at other times. But yeah, great to see some uh, familiar faces and some names I'm not that familiar with as well. So please do um, write in the chat um, who you are and uh, where you're working maybe and uh, yeah, anything that you would like us to know. We have a packed agenda, so we're gonna move fairly uh, swiftly on. Um, we're gonna hear from colleagues in Somalia. Uh, we also have an update on the global HLP AOR, which uh, myself and Ombretta Tempra with UN Habitat will uh, provide. Uh, we're going to hear from the Shelter Cluster and their HLP advisor. Uh, we're also going to hear from colleagues working in uh, Ukraine. I see Michael there and uh, I think John will join at the right time. He's probably here already. Uh, also, we have uh, Lorena Nieto and Carolina Espinosa from the R4B platform, so that's working with refugees from Venezuela who are going to provide an update. And then we'll be over to you for any updates as well that you would like to give us uh, on your work or areas of interest related to HLP, housing, London property. So, um, Shazan, I'll turn to you first. Um, you're going to give us an update and on the work that you've been uh, doing in Somalia. Uh, but yeah, please do introduce yourself and over to you. Thank you, Jim, um, and good afternoon and good morning. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, so just let me know uh, when you can see it. Yes. Yep. See it now. Okay. Um, just give me a moment. Sure. As always, uh, anytime if you have questions or comments, please feel free to use the chat. You can also uh, raise your hand and do all those kinds of things as well, and I'll, I'll come to you when I can. Um, but yeah, please, Shazam, over to you. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Um, so my name is uh, Shazan Kirubi, and I'm the information counseling um, and legal assistant uh, specialist in Somalia. And um, I'm going to be presenting on a cost analysis on uh, the losses that we have made in investments and infrastructures due to forced evictions in Somalia um, in 2022. Um, and maybe just to start off, uh, when we decided to undertake this analysis, it was to inform um, the current advocacy. Uh, we wanted to inform it based on, on evidence, but also we've seen that housing, land and property is not being prioritized within the emergency response. So it's not like wash or food um, that are that are considered as a priority. So this was to inform and advocate for further funding, but also prioritization and integration of HLP within the emergency response. So maybe just to start off, uh, is just with a bit of context. Um, so forced evictions, as we all know, is widely acknowledged um, as a key issue, key protection concern in Somalia. And this year, because of the ongoing drought and looming famine, but also conflict that has arisen in the later part of the year, we've seen that more than 1.7 million individuals have been displaced because of drought and conflict. And majority of these newly displaced families are joining urban centers. So they are settling in IDP settlements that are predominantly hosted on privately owned land without any secure land tenure arrangements. Um, according to the latest data, over 90% of IDP settlements in Somalia are settled in urban and peri-urban centers, and majority of these are on privately owned land. Um, so within the same period, uh, that is between January and November 2022, um, over 150,000 um, individuals, 158,000 individuals have been forcefully evicted in Somalia, 
Um, and the highest number of evictions took place um, in the first half, half of the year. And that's also when we saw a large increase in displacement figures. So it, it went hand in hand. Um, Banadi region um, remains a key hotspot for forced evictions with over 81% of all evictions being recorded in the year, reported in two districts in Mogadishu known as Danile and Kada. Um, and forced evictions is due to a number of factors in Somalia. Most of these are interrelating. So it can be illegal occupation and squatting, land grabs, uh, development and infrastructure projects, which has seen an increase in land value. Uh, so most private land owners are, um, are claiming back their land for development. Um, under urban re re redevelopment, contested and multiple claims and natural hazards, um, as we've seen flood risk, potential flooding and drought and famine. Um, however, despite these high numbers, we've also seen an increase in eviction preventions taking place. And that has been because of the coordinated approach taken by the HLP AOR and its partners. Um, so in 2022, for the first time since we started eviction monitoring in Somalia, we've seen that the eviction prevention figures are actually higher than the evictions being reported. So we have 100, over 176,000 individuals that have been protected from forced evictions because of um, preventive engagements. Um, so this is just to show you the statistics um, from 2018 to 2022. And this data is public. It's on our dashboard. Um, for those who do not have the link, we are going to share it after this meeting. Um, so you can see, uh, since we started um, eviction monitoring, uh, we started further back in 2015, 2016, but we usually consider the data from 2018 as the most accurate. Um, so from 2018 to 2022, you can see the trend. Um, evictions have largely decreased, even though the number is still quite high, um, and there's been an increase in eviction prevention. So in terms of the human impact, before we go to the cost analysis, we just wanted to highlight uh, the human impact of forced evictions, as we largely know. Um, we've seen that forced evictions intensifies inequality, social conflict and segregation. It also affects the most vulnerable and marginalized groups, such as women, children, minorities, the elderly, and people with disabilities. We've also seen that forced eviction results in severe trauma and serious declines in the standard of living. Um, it perpetuates this um, cycle, this vicious cycle of living in extreme poverty and displacement, but also it renders people homeless and landless. Um, we've also seen the impact of forced evictions on physical and mental health, and this is an area that remains largely unaddressed in Somalia. Um, the eviction risk assessments that have been undertaken by the HLP AOR and its partners have alluded to the fact that um, forced evictions has led to an increase in in um, worsened health conditions, particularly in mental health. But also a, a study that was done back in 2021 um, highlighted that IDPs reported issues such as diarrhea, malaria, pneumonia, measles, skin infections, as well as mental health issues such as anxiety, stress, uh, physical distress and trauma. Um, also, we have the impact on forced evictions on children and families. Um, we've seen that forced evictions, and I will show you from the cost analysis, that forced evictions um, leads to uh, children not being able to attend schooling. Uh, one, because of the disruption that it causes uh, when a family is evicted, but also the distraction to schools that we've also seen. We've also seen that children that undergo forced evictions um, have um, experience some mental health issues such as increased anxiety, stress, um, and also trauma. So this is just to give you in hindsight what we did. So through the use of our different partners, but also our paralegals, we largely looked at the data that we had for forced evictions in 2022. And in Banadir, because uh, it's quite high, what we did for Banadir region, we only considered evictions um, that affected over a thousand families. But in the rest of the locations, so in Jubaland, Puntland, and Somaliland, we looked at all forced eviction events that were reported. This is because in Banadir, we have uh, 
quite a number of small scale, but also large scale evictions. Um, and then we also uh, talked to different camp leaders and different communities. And we also went back to the sites um, that were impacted by evictions. So as you can see, uh, through this analysis, we were able to gather that over 6,000 latrines have been destroyed in Somalia. Um, so majority of the destruction was on wash infrastructure. So latrines, water points, uh, what we call as backards um, in, in Somalia. So these are uh, probably like large, uh, large um, uh, I, I don't know how to describe it, but larger wells, not wells, but um, water areas for water. Uh, we also saw destruction of schools and temporary learning centers, um, solar streetlights, community centers, which again, um, we saw large destruction from community centers that were actually put up by the community themselves. Um, we also saw large destructions of other businesses, but we small scale businesses, but we weren't able to quantify that. So we on in this analysis, we just included um, we looked at site level com, site level infrastructure, so water points, um, latrine schools, nutrition centers, MCHs. Um, so that was what we looked at. But there was of course other other the destruction of small scale businesses and housing that we weren't able to quantify. So the costing is actually much higher than what we projected. Um, then also other things that we weren't able to quantify is the disruption to education that we see that over 80% of households that are affected by eviction can no longer send their children to school due to high transport costs. Um, and most of the time, most families would um, go through evictions probably more than once. So we've seen up to families being impacted by evictions up to five times. So, so just to put it in, in, um, in hindsight. Then we also included a number of other costs that are incurred at a household level due to forced evictions. And this is mainly relocation costs. Um, so relocation of schools, relocation of community centers, relocation of IDP shelters, so the housing infrastructure itself. Um, also the transport costs, um, we, we included that. Um, so from this, we were able to estimate um, that in total, uh, the humanitarian and communities have lost an estimated of $4.6 million. Um, and this is just an estimated cost. As I said before, we were just looking at uh, site level destruction of infrastructure. So we really didn't look at household level. So this costing is just an estimated cost. And what we could see at the end of the year is, is, much, is much higher than this. Um, but this just puts things into perspective in terms of how we're doing our own programming and how we're setting up infrastructures in sites without secure land tenure arrangements in place. Uh, so for the humanitarian, you can see um, the highest costing was in Mogadishu, which again corresponds to the data because over 80% of evictions take place in Mogadishu. So we could see 3.4 million um, in terms of loss, but also 1.6 uh, for the humanitarian community and 1.7 for the uh, community infrastructures. And this was mainly latrines and water points, but also community centers uh, for the community. Then by Doha, uh, we could see about 200 190,000 loss, uh, 229,000 for the humanitarian community and 66,000 for the for the communities. Then Kismayo, about 127,000 loss, 52,000 for the humanitarian community and 75,000 uh, for the communities themselves. Then in Puntland, we undertook the analysis in Garraway, Bosaso and Galkayo and we estimated a loss of over 620,000, uh, 480,000 from the humanitarian community and 138,000 from the community itself. Then lastly, Somaliland, uh, whereby we looked at Hagesa, Lassanod, and Bebera and Boroma. Um, we saw about 160,000 loss, 151,000 from the humanitarian community and 9,000 from the community itself. So this gives you a total estimated loss of 4.6 million. Um, so what are the recommendations? Uh, when I began, um, 
was to explain to you the main reason why we undertook this kind of analysis. And it was because we were finding that HLP issues are not being prioritized within the emergency response. So you can see from our analysis, if we don't mainstream and prioritize HLP issues um, from the very onset, then this can cause serious harm to displacement affected communities. It's also important that we map out HLP issues at the very onset of an emergency. And for Somalia specifically, this has included identifying eviction hotspots, mapping out the risks, undertaking land tenure analysis to also inform targeting and potential sites for infrastructure investments. Um, the HLP AOR has combined a list for sites that have secured tenure and has shared this out largely with other clusters to consider this for their targeting. Um, we also need to prioritize HLP due diligence prior to investing or establishing any form of infrastructure, whether it's in the short, medium or long term. The second recommendation is on strengthening area-based coordination, um, and we need to ensure that resources are allocated for the establishment of functional area-based coordination mechanisms. Somalia is um, a country where we have good practice when it comes to the establishment of government-led eviction task forces. And this is something that we need to continue investing in to ensure that we're not only coordinating when it comes to eviction prevention initiatives, but also when it comes to reporting on forced evictions because what we've seen in Somalia is that individual agencies are reaching out to local authorities when an, when an eviction takes place to ensure continuity of services. But we need to ensure a coordinated approach um, to have maximum impact. Then the last recommendation is a bit more long-term and it's on investing in capacity development and in legal and policy reform. Um, and this is to ensure that HLP um, is made sustainable and also institutionalized in, within our response. So this, uh, we're talking about prioritizing the review and development of functional land systems, including land governance and land administration in Somalia, because we still have a very weak policy and legal uh, framework when it comes to HLP. Then we also need to prioritize the HLP capacity needs um, of local authorities to ensure our response is sustainable. So of late, we've said undertaking um, capacity needs assessment, and we're using this to inform our trainings, technical assistance, and the provision of material support aimed at addressing HLP capacity gaps. Um, so I'll stop there and back to you, Jim, and i um, happy to answer any question. Thank you very much, Shazan. Yes, let's straight away open up for any questions or comments. Um, I don't know if this sort of approach of this sort of cost analysis is something that you've seen before or done yourselves. Um, uh, yeah, I thought it was uh, quite an interesting way to frame uh, the, the sort of human impact of forced evictions, but also the economic impacts as well. And I suppose, a, a, you know, initial question from me, Shazan, is, is do you see this as a, a sort of a, a an advocacy source that you can use to sort of advocate and how would you use this uh, data that you've um, compiled around the sort of costs would you say yeah um should i answer that first or all other uh, questions uh, actually let's so we get i see a couple of hands raised so let's get those other questions and then we can do around yeah uh joseph over to you yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, this is Joseph Sheckler from Housing and Land Rights Network. Um, we have also developed a methodology for quantifying cost losses and damages in the case of eviction, whether it's eviction or uh, other dispossession or uh, destruction, or even uh, the changes or violations of human rights that arise from the context of privatization. Um, and we've also adapted that uh, to the, the values of women in cases of uh, various denials of uh, inheritance rights and other kinds of serial dispossession. Uh, and this year uh, adapted that for uh, cases where uh, a duty holder uh, or other liable liable party is responsible for uh, a violation of housing and land rights in the context of climate change. Uh, so it's a really, really interesting approach. Uh, it's very uh, adaptable. You even scaled it up uh, to uh, apply to uh, land restitution in Yemen in the case of what well, someday uh, transitional justice. 
Um, and it and it really is a, an excellent uh, advocacy tool. I can just verify from our experience. It's uh, it's really great to see that happening here. Thanks, Joseph. And do feel free to share any links of anything that might be useful for us to look at as well. Yeah, um, yeah we have about 30 applications. I'll put a couple uh, okay. links on the chat. Thanks. Thank you, Jess. Thank you. Um, so, Ombreta, then Jamal, and then I'll come back to you, Shazan. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Shazan, uh, for the very excellent and in informative presentation, and good afternoon, everyone or good morning and good evening. Um, I also uh, placed in the chat uh, a report we prepared at UN Habitat, uh, a research on land and conflict in the southern Somalia and Jubaland. Uh, and I want to, to stress one of the part of the recommendation that were also in the presentation, which is basically the need of, um, of a functioning land administration system, because I mean, uh, over the years, and actually I started myself uh, working in Somalia, I think in 2004, uh, we have pumped, um, you know, millions, if not billions, actually for sure billions into humanitarian assistance. Um, and I think that what we see on the ground doesn't make, is not, um, is not comparable to the investment made. And uh, also, I mean, there is a lot of lessons learned and capacity we built and tools we developed and successful approaches we tested also on HLP collectively from various organizations, including, of course, NRC, UN Habitat, UNHCR, DRC, et cetera. So, I mean, the, the real, uh, uh, you know, when, when also the, the, the presentation was mentioning that, um, you know, there are illegal uh, transaction and illegal occupation and land grabbing. The reality is that basically there is no way in Somalia, no one can buy or sell land legally because there is not a functioning, except in some few, uh, few urban centers, basically, I mean, there is not a system that records who has the right to on what, you know, looking at private owners, but also state, it's not clear which state, which level of state has the right to take which decision on land, if it's the federal state, if it's the, um, uh, you know, federal government or the state, if it's the municipality, which department, so there is a complete unclarity uh, also, as, as was mentioned in the presentation at the legal and institutional framework, and there is not a functioning land registration system. So, in fact, it's impossible to say, <laughs> you know, who, who is the rightful owner and therefore, who has the, who, how to secure the, the secondary rights on the landowners. Because of course, if one has the right to stay or the right to rent or, or the right to stay on a plot of land for a specific uh, amount of time under specific condition, also the, the rights of the owner who owns the land below these secondary rights needs to be protected and needs to be clear who, who this person or this institution is. And that's completely missing. Uh, in Somalia. So overall, I mean, as well in our report, and I conclude, uh, we really focus very much on the fact that we need to establish a functioning land recordation system uh, to clarify the land rights bit by bit, uh, you know, to re re resolve the dis dis disputes or disagreements on that side, and overall build a functioning legal and institutional um, set of, uh, you know, system that supports this with uh, linked with data information infrastructure. So in a way, definitely all what was mentioned is good and important, but we will not at the end ever be able to reach anywhere at scale that is sustainable without working on the longer term perspective as well. Thank you very much and over. Thanks, Ombretta. Um, I'll turn to you, Jamal, and then back to Shazan. Yes, thank you very much, Jim. Thank you very much, colleagues. And of course, thank you so much, Shazan, for what has been a very informative presentation. I think there are some very useful lessons to be drawn from, from what you would have just shared. Um, I, I do agree um, entirely with Ombretta on some of the macro level initiatives that serve as 
um, if I if I if I may say, cross cutting imperatives to the achievement of improved tenure security in the context of Somalia. But I think that there are also some micro level and Shazan, we would have had this conversation a couple months ago and I, I take this opportunity to note the exceptional work done by NRC where cash for rent is concerned and the tremendous opportunity around the HDP nexus that exists in that regard. Um, but I'll just like to, to highlight that there are perhaps a number of micro level initiatives that, that are perhaps in train potentially on paper but also in practice, um, as have been facilitated, whether via the, the National Durable Solutions Strategy of, of Somalia, um, specifically the components that speak to housing, land, and property, and of course, the nexus-related um, opportunities that exist in that regard, recognizing that synergy between the protection-related work or the protection-oriented work and the solutions-oriented work. And I, I take, for example, the work around um, the evictions moratorium. Um, specifically, um, I think, for example, of the, the, um, the operationalization of the national evictions guidelines. It would be really interesting to hear um, what is being done in that regard, as well as the interim protocol on, on the distribution of housing. Um, and that's just one of those micro level initiatives that we can perhaps look into whether at the level of the HLP AOR. And then of course, the, the implementation of the April 2020 evictions moratorium, really drawing from lessons around the Baidoa district administration, the work that has been done in that regard where evictions, um, where the evictions moratorium, evictions monitoring, et cetera, is concerned. So, so I think perhaps we can, put a question to the table, um, or perhaps to you, Shazan, as, as in some of the opportunities that may exist at the micro level, some of the small initiatives, cash for rent, what is the scope for cash for rent from a, from a nexus standpoint in really facilitating um, the reduction of evictions um, across um, displacement affected communities? Um, and then you also spoke about area-based work. What opportunities exist at the level of the displacement affected communities and really operationalizing evictions, monitoring, et cetera. Um, so, so those are just a few questions that I'll put out, but, but, um, but given the fact that we have limited time, I'll just leave it at that. Jim, thank you very much. Shazan, over to you. Thanks, Jamal. Thank you. I think what's obvious as well from these questions is there's this subject and this area um, are probably deserving of a dedicated session. So I think we should maybe look to do that um, next year because uh, there's so much to unpack here. But Shazan, over to you for uh, some responses and then uh, sadly we'll have to then move to the next. Yep. Um, so very quickly because of time, um, Jim, on your question on advocacy, this has been very useful because um, as I started when, um, as you know, Somalia right now, um, we are ongoing the worst drought that we have seen in the last 40 years. Um, and we've seen massive displacement into urban centers. So at the start of the year and towards the end of last year, um, a lot of funding was coming in for emergency response, but HLP remains critically underfunded as much as we recognize that post evictions is a key issue in Somalia, um, Evelyn would tell you that we remain critically underfunded as compared to other clusters. Um, so this has been very useful in really shedding light on some of the issues that we are having at an area level in terms of, yes, we can fund um, wash infrastructures, but if you're setting them up in sites that don't have secure tenure and agencies are not undertaking proper due diligence all in the name of we are under an emergency, then we're just wasting resources because three months, six months later, if this um, if this infrastructure is being destroyed, then what are we what are we really doing in terms of um, value for money? Um, also, in terms of raising funding for HLP, donors such as some donors such as FCDO have really prioritized HLP within their their strategies. And one of the things that we've seen, even with um, the MRP, which is the minimum response package, um, that is kind of a package that that has been um, released for drought in Somalia and is coming through. Uh, 
three UN agencies, that is uh, UNICEF, w, WFP, and IOM, one of the things that FCDO really stressed on was the inclusion of HLP within the response. And um, this really helped us secure some funding for some of the work that we are um, undertaking in Somalia. So I would say it's been very useful and we'll continue to do more of. And I think also Evelyn has used it in a lot of bilateral meetings um, in her capacity as the coordinator with donors, but also with the ICCG. Um, but still more work remains on that. Then in terms of Jamal's question, very, very, very quickly, uh, there are quite a number of um, micro level, as he put it, micro level, um, work that is taking place. So on the rental subsidy, um, as you know, we had another iteration of the of the pilot that we had back in 2016 um, under our durable solutions program back in 2018, 2019 to 2020. Um, and we are currently revising it because the main exit strategy uh, for a sustainable rental subsidy program is the livelihood component. So there are some very useful lessons learned um, on integration between HLP and livelihood. And we're trying to see how we can scale up. But that uh, first step with understanding the rental market, especially in Mogadishu. So that's something that we are going to be prioritizing next year on the basis of if some funding comes in. Um, then in terms of Baidoa, just to let you know that Baidoa passed an urban land law and one key achievement for the HLP AOR in Somalia has been incorporation on a chapter of forced evictions in the urban land law. So just that coming from having the moratorium to actually including how to address forced evictions within the, the law is really a key achievement for the HLP AOR. Um, the next step, of course, is now in terms of enforcement and having proper structures in place to be able to enforce the law. But there are a lot of other achievements on government-led eviction task forces that I think because of time, maybe we can have a bilateral or I can share it through mail. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. That was uh, great, fantastic. And yeah, I mean, please do if you're if you're willing, feel free to share your email address or whatever, and people can uh, uh, bombard you with requests for more information, um, or not. You don't have to. But we should definitely, I think, look at a session that looks at not only the work that's being done in Somalia, but where some of those similar issues are being um, addressed or challenges are being faced as well. Um, thank you. And. Um, that's great. Thank you, Shazan. Really appreciate you taking the time to, to present to us. Um, so I'm going to move on to the, sec the next uh, item on the uh, agenda. Um, it's a little update from the global HLP AOR side uh, from myself. Um, and I'm just going to uh, share my screen to just talk through a couple of slides, um, if I can remember how to do that. Uh, um, but um, but one of the key the key things I was wanting to um, uh, discuss and just to update you on is um, around um, the leadership of the HLP AOR. Um, we've we've talked about it uh, before. Um, currently, NRC are the lead of the HLP AOR. We're going to be joined by UN Habitat as co-lead um, starting 2023. And we have Ombret Tempra, who was uh, made the comment earlier. Uh, in response to Shazan's presentation, who will be the focal point from the Habitat side. And I think, Ombretta, your uh, comment um, also made well the point that uh, we need to be looking at how we connect that sort of emergency humanitarian response with uh, some of the longer term thinking and uh, and the role and the expertise of UN Habitat in doing that, which I think is going to really add to the, the work we can do as a, as a community. Um, so as part of our... Uh, development of this co-leadership, we've um, uh, come up with a sort of a working memo that's been signed off at the sort of highest levels within all our organizations and just wanted to just talk you through that briefly because I know for some colleagues there's some questions around will this change things, what does it mean to have NRC and UN Habitat co-leading and I think the overall uh, message and you can see some of the, the points there but that we will be collaborating on an equal footing, we're leading together uh, and you know, the interest in the positions of the HLPOR are what come first. And we're supporting you still at the national level as best we can, keen to improve that. We're also looking for opportunities at the global level uh, to be advocating and uh, 
working together on, on HLP um, sort of guidance tools, all those kind of things as well. And, you know, we're going to be sort of reviewing the partnership, how it's working. Um, and so, yeah, really keen to hear from you if you have questions. But I just want to just share as well some of the specific areas, uh, just so that you can see. Um, this is us showing our working, I suppose. Um, but how we're going to be looking at um, dividing up some of the roles and responsibilities within the AOR. So, I mean, you can see there, there's an assumption that if one of us is leading, the other one is uh, actively participating. Um, but the way we're looking at the sort of continuity and the consistency around the sort of working with the humanitarian response. So, um, you know, NRC will still take a sort of a lead role on that sort of coordination and humanitarian side. Um, and then UN Habitat will be leading and focusing on some of our work with the development and the kind of nexus and, and looking also at urban as well. So we're going to keep that you know, in some ways similar focus that, that NRC has now leading, but we're going to bring in as well the expertise and experience from the UN Habitat side. And of course, working together on strategy, planning, communication and, and all of those kind of things as well. So I just wanted to share that really to um, just let you know how we're um, yeah, sort of uh, how we're we're sort of conceiving of uh, of the um, of the partnership, and um, just open up quickly to any questions that you might have on, for myself or for Ombretta as well on what it's going to mean. Um, and then, yeah, I'll move on to the the next thing. But yeah, if anyone had any questions or, or comments, you're very welcome. Ombretta, do you have a question? No, I just want to say that uh, that we are very pleased of uh, supporting NRC and, and uh, on this role that uh, and uh, congratulate really the leadership of NRC over the past years at the global level and also in many of the country operations and uh, you know fully agree with what of course Jim presented on our common behalf and um, looking forward to to be stronger together on that. Thank you and over. Thanks, Ombretta. Thank you. Um, yeah, and please, anyone, if you have any questions, you can either email us or you know put them in the chat or raise your hand here. But we can talk about this beyond this meeting. And um, I, I suppose one of the things is particularly if you have any questions around what it means for HLP coordination in the country where you're working and you know, sort of opportunities there. And uh, maybe if you had any you know, questions or just weren't sure, then please do do feel free to to ask. Um, so part of what we're going to be doing uh, together, you know, a first stop is to our work plan for the uh, the coming years. And uh, we're going to be looking into sort of do a two year 2023, 2024 uh, work plan and uh, really keen to to get your views. And I'm going to hand over to Ombretta in a moment to, to discuss that. But just before then, just want to just share just as a, as a little bit of a reminder that for the HLP AOR, we have um, these sort of strategic priorities that we've been sort of looking at. So supporting the HLP coordination and response, and also looking at that sort of bringing more attention to HLP through donor engagement, advocacy and HLP sort of across the clusters, as well as trying to improve the uh, AOR's uh, governance and resilience. And just a couple of comments on those. I think there's, uh, there's uh, something that I've mentioned before, but it still kind of comes up is uh, the need to really advocate for HLP to be seen as a humanitarian sort of emergency need, as well as the links being made with uh, durable solutions and nexus and uh, longer term thinking as well. Um, we've seen some examples where OCHA maybe need reminding of how important it is to think of um, HLP in a humanitarian uh, setting. So we're going to be looking at doing some work around that. And, and and then just to sort of mention on the AOR side, we're we're recruiting for um, an information management and sort of coordination sort of support, particularly around the francophone countries, but also supporting globally. Um, looking for that role to be based in Dakar. So um, yeah, we're just about to publish the, the sort of the job description, make that live. So if you or someone you know might be interested, please do get in touch, and we can share the details around that. Um, but yes, just on the um, the work plan itself. So some of the, we're keen to get your ideas and your inputs. Some of the things that we uh, 
we we try to sort of understand what's working well, what could be improved. You know, we're talking about tools, guidance, some work to support um, data and information management for HLP. Are there advocacy needs? Are there other things, events, webinars that we can do? What can we do with others? Uh, we're working quite closely with um, uh, so some of the other clusters at the moment. Um, and we particularly want to support HLP coordination in country. So we're talking about you know, better functioning sort of help desk capacity, um, identifying which are the priority operations to support, looking at a more sort of systematic integration of HLP with other, other clusters. Um, and then there's always questions around advocacy and training that we can do more on. And we've had these sort of thematic areas that we have looked at. Um, so yeah, just sharing those really to kind of uh, prompt you and to help you think about some of the things that we have collaborated on with others. Um, and these areas remain a sort of key focus for us. And of course, we can't all do everything, but I think there are some key HLP related activities and collaborations we can do. Um, yeah, I just wanted to share those things to get you thinking a little bit and just hand over now to Ombretta to talk a little bit more about the planning for next year. Thank you, Jim. Um, and uh, yeah, hello again. Uh, so I've just also placed it in the chat. We developed a very uh, short uh, survey to get your views on um, on how to move forward. I mean, get your views on what you found more valuable of the work that was done uh, in the previous phase and help us shaping the way forward. So I'm just trying to um, briefly take you through, if you see my screen, I guess. Yes, we see that. Um, the short survey um uh, thank you that's great so of course your information just to make sure um you in case you know we can refer back to some of the answers uh, not not on the feedback what uh, geographical area or country are you covering and what's the language uh, or your of, or working um so that we we are also looking at strengthening the the language uh, the diversification, as Jim was also mentioning. Uh, and then uh, I'm just taking you through this question very quickly. Um, so which of the areas uh, of the work that we did in the past two years you, were, you found more relevant? You can type some feedback, also perhaps some, some further detail so that we understand exactly what was valuable and for you and we can build on that. Uh, then there is also a question on the topics. Uh, Jim just screened the key ones we focused on, but uh, you know some are likely to remain relevant, uh, but some there might be some new ones that we want to introduce or put a bit more effort to, uh, on. Um, now, in terms of typology of activities, uh, we listed here some of the ones that we, we do more frequently already, um, you know, capacity building, training, online discussion, uh, some advisory services to countries, of course, coordination and partnership, knowledge and advocacy, but there might be other uh, that you feel uh, has been a gap and you would like uh, the HLPOR coordination to introduce. So um, please do uh, give us your inputs on that. Uh, and then uh, there is a section that looks at what you, uh, as a member of the HLPOR or your organization, are already planning to implement in the coming couple of years. Of course, we, we we know that uh, work plans evolve and you know we, we are not uh, definitely able to to predict uh, under percent or even maybe 50 percent what we'll be doing in the next couple of years but uh, we might have some pointers uh, some of you might have already some activities or areas lined up and uh, we would like to you know to 
build synergies and, and capitalizing on what's already been uh, done uh, from uh, the member side and then maybe bring it uh, as we just did, for example, for Somalia, in terms of presenting to the wider group, uh, what were the learnings, what were the you know findings uh, so that others can benefit from that. Um, and also would like to know when you have already something planned, if there is some support that HLP AOR could be providing uh, at globally, uh, but also perhaps what kind of additional support at the country level you would find it helpful so that we can see if from the global level we can facilitate that both from uh, you know organization and individuals who are already members, but perhaps in our wider networks, because we know all of us, of course, uh, interact with different partners and experts in different uh, uh, networks. So we might be able to, to find uh, some additional way of supporting you. Um, again, you know, if you will be able to bring back some of this learning to the HLP AOR and what. Um, and then some guidance on the areas that you'd be interested to contribute to. Uh, as a person or an organization, you know, you can freely answer this, this uh, you know, uh, and then we will analyze it from our side. So do not feel restrained by the format, but just, uh, you know, see how you can provide inputs. Uh, there is also some question on geographical areas. Um, uh, the HLPOR has been active in, uh, in many countries. Some were, are not yet covered. Some might be needing further attention. Uh, so let from your perspective, let us know where, uh, which one these are. Um, some feedback on what we have been doing well and what we can do better or differently in the next two years. And uh, more generally, any other comments, suggestion, inputs that you would like to ask to, to take into consideration. And this is just, um, a quick snapshot basically to say we are looking at this aspect. We would like to get your initial uh, input so that we can then design a bit more structured uh, work plan session early next year uh, and, uh, and seek for additional inputs and more detailed description in the next uh, meeting. So if you have any questions, comments, please feel free. Otherwise, back to you, Jim. Thanks, Ombretta. Thank you. Yes, and, and please do take a few minutes if you can to fill that in. It will be really super helpful, not only for us as we plan, but to make sure we can be, you know, doing the most useful and uh, effective work um, around this this whole area of housing, land, and property. So, yeah, thank you for your attention uh, on that. That would be great. And there's links in the chat, um, and we'll send a follow up email afterwards as well. Um, great, thank you. So next, I want to turn to our colleague Ibire Lopez from the Global Shelter Cluster, the HLP advisor there, um, for an update. Ibire, nice to see you. And actually, I was just thinking before we do that, I just want to say to anyone who can turn on their camera and just sort of smile and wave so we can see all your wonderful faces, that would be very nice, even if just for a few seconds. Yes, here we go. I recognise some of these. This is nice. Okay, thank you for your uh, indulgence of this. <laughs> it's good. It's nice to see people. Thank you. Um, okay, feel free to you know, back away from the being visible now if you'd like, or, or remain so. Up to you. Ibire, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jim. So nice to see everyone's everyone's faces. Good, good move in asking them to turn on the, the camera. Makes it more personable, doesn't it? Um, so two, I think just two updates from my side. One is the uh, the online training that we've been working on. So we've been uh, working on this um, online training platform. Um, it's uh, on-demand uh, training on HLP for CCCM and shelter practitioners. Uh, it's going to be open to anyone. So um, when it's launched, I'm going to share the link with everyone. Um, and the idea is that um, it will be a training uh, based on video. So there'll be uh, video scenes and it'll be interactive. And I wanted to just give you a preview of what it's gonna look like. So uh, hopefully that's gonna work. Um, let me try to share the screen with you and see if you can have the audio as well. Can you see it? Yes, we see it. 
An abandoned village with empty houses could be a quick solution. As long as it truly is abandoned, you need to investigate more. There are three actions you can take to further your investigation, each one taking a full day to complete. What you do next is up to you. Yeah, am I back now? Yes. Yes, you are. Yes. Yeah. So, so the idea, um, so it, the training is divided in five modules and uh, four modules. Um, it's introduction, so the fundamentals of HLP. Um, then you have security of tenure, um, returns and restitution. So the the cases the cases where people are returning after the conflict or after the disaster, they're returning, and then what HLP issues come up in that uh, phase of of the emergency. Uh, and the last one is HRP and inclusion, um, which will, which will involve an issue with uh, women rights in, in HRP. And the idea was to have uh, realistic scenarios that we encounter on the field and how we try to resolve them. There will be different quests. So it's almost like a game uh, where we'll, there will be quests that you can choose and then uh, you have consequences to your choices. So anyway, I'm looking forward to, uh, to sharing this with everyone. Uh, we did this in partnership with a with a private company. It's looking it's looking all right, uh, and um, yeah, uh, I, I'm looking forward to getting the feedback as well because we we want to have other inter iterations of of this type of training. The other one, um, the other update is uh, is just a shout out. Maybe Jim Kennedy on this, is on the call. I don't know, but on Thursday, on the 15th of December, there will be a um, a workshop of the, uh, the, the um, site planning community of practice. And the theme will be HRP, HRP and site planning. Um, so if you are interested, I think a lot of people in this call might be, um, you know, you, you're, you're free to join. I think um, Jim will share the link or I can share the link, link later on in the chat um, for you to participate. And uh, that's it from my side. Thanks, Abirai. Um, quick question. Did you say when the training is likely to be available? I can't remember if you said Yeah, that. so we're, we're finishing in December. Uh, that's our, that's what our contract says. So it's going to be delivered now. It's almost finished. But um, we're going to launch it in January so we can do um, a better launch. People will be back from work. And then, um, yeah, so, so we're planning to launch it early, early January. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. And if, um, if Jim's on the call and could share the the link for the 15th December meeting, that would be great. Um, okay, great, thanks, Iberi, thank you for that. And yeah, I'm sure Iberi would welcome any comments, uh, reactions to that little uh, trailer, um, as well as uh, when the the, 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 the the substantive training is released as well. Um, so please do feel free to, to share something in the chat on that one. Um, great, thank you. Um, now we're going to turn to, um, to Ukraine and to, we have, uh, Michael Sholod and I think John Umra as well is with us uh, to give an update on some of the work you've been involved with there, um, looking at HLP and how we respond to, to some of the challenges there. So yeah, Michael, John, over to you. Perfect, perfect. John, you want to go first for a couple seconds here? Sure. I'll um, share a document if I can, Jim. Or sure. And, oh, sorry, I should have said probably worth um, uh, just introducing yourselves briefly as well, just in case uh, people yep. don't know who you are. Right. Um, 
Well, I'll take a, a crack at it. Just to maybe kind of an, a broad overview, and then um, yeah, certainly get into some some detail. So, uh, since we last um, uh, talked about this at, uh, on this cluster, there's been uh, a great deal of movement forward, a lot of moving parts uh, going on now. Uh, we've had uh, two. Uh, what we're calling guidance notes uh, produced by the effort. The, the first one was to uh, the Ukrainian government, uh, which was a, a critique of its current uh, compensation law and how that aligns with current best practice for mass claims and transitional justice for large scale uh, housing land property restitution and compensation. Uh, recall there's about 14 million people displaced uh, from the, their HLP, largest in the world presently. Uh, so, so it's a um, it's it's a, an effort that is gaining profile in um, in Ukraine and, and among donors. Our second uh, concept note was to a Canadian senator. This was the senator that uh, went forward with legislation to repurpose uh, frozen assets uh, uh, from Russia held by Canada for the purpose of um, repurposing those assets for the reconstruction of. Uh, of Ukraine. That senator wanted to know how such repurposing would align with uh, compensation efforts for uh, for the dislocated population in, in Ukraine. Um, we've also connected up with uh, with IOM. We just completed in Kiev, uh, let's see, a week and a half ago or so, a, uh, a, um, a workshop with Ukrainian uh, government officials, NGOs, uh, donors, etc., on uh, the need to move forward with planning now for uh, HLP uh, recovery, including compensation, uh, restitution, use of technology, uh, best practice for uh, mass claims, uh, transitional justice, that kind of thing. Uh, our next step along those lines is to reconvene a, a much more technical workshop in Kyiv that looks at the, the, the connecting of the dots, the how to exactly for uh, for, for mass claims uh, moving forward. Uh, so, so that's that's kind of one line. Uh, there's a separate line that has us moving toward um, uh, another conference. Michael can uh, can talk more about that. He's, he's spearheading a great deal of this. He's, uh, to all of our benefit, is, is uh, um, in, in Kyiv. And so he moves around quite a bit and making a great deal of many uh, valuable connections, including uh, with the couple of uh, ambassadors, one former Canadian ambassador to Ukraine, another American uh, special appointee that looks at social bonds. Michael knows much more about that as well. Uh, part of this effort is, is to select two pilot uh, locations in which we can uh, test a, uh, uh, an app. In other words, a very quick way for uh, the dislocated themselves uh, the impact of themselves um, to, to upload claims uh, for HLP compensation, particularly for damaged and destroyed uh, HLP in, in a number of, of areas. Um, so that's just very broad brush, what, we'll, what we've, we've got going. Um, Michael, can I turn it over to you for yep. some much more uh, sort of pointed explanation? Sure, sure. Um so thanks everybody. Thanks, John. Um, you know, basically, I guess if I was to encapsulate what's going on, you know, a lot of us have thankfully to a lot of the folks in this group um, who've contributed to these guidance notes as we've gone along the process. And we're now getting to the point where we are um, basically, we have an opportunity to rebuild um, a couple, two specific villages. And in fact, we have, um, you know, uh, actually local and regional authority approval to do two regions around Kiev, Demer and Makarov. Uh, and we're starting with two villages, Andrivka and Kozarovici, where we plan to, um, you know, field test. So this is an opportunity to test the entire kind of HLP process that would normally, say, come in after the conflict's over and would operate under, you know, kind of a transitional justice um, framework. And you know, the opportunity in Ukraine is that, you know, A, there's a conflict that's still going on. It's in the other area of the country, but there's still people that need to be rehoused and buildings and, and businesses and, and uh, local authority buildings that need to be rebuilt, schools and, and things like this. And, you know, we are using this as an opportunity to pilot all of a lot of these um, best practices that this group has been developing over the years. So as John mentioned, a mass claims process, 
you know, we plan to uh, pilot the mass claims process. We plan to pilot a technology that will allow people to file their own claims without having any kind of strings attached. They won't have to have established identity. They won't have to necessarily identify themselves in the claims process. They'll be able to do it from a mobile device or from a computer. Those claims will then be adjudicated, assigned to mass categories, and then compensation will be awarded um, to allow for the rebuilding of these towns, focusing on things like, you know, sustainability, um, environmentalism, uh, new, you know, kind of urban plans, so that we're not just rebuilding, we're renewing or building back better. Uh, some of the other little bits and pieces in this is, as John has said, you know, we are working on kind of the soup to nuts angle on this. We're working on trying to do the, you know, provide uh, an illustrative example of mass claims, how it could be done, how it could be scaled to larger populations, in fact, 14 million refugees, um, how we could uh, basically move the money from seized Russian assets into Ukraine for the rebuilding. So this would apply to any other potential HLP conflict type situation where, you know, this kind of, um, John and I call it the sanctions bomb gets dropped on an aggressor. And now there's a framework to move assets into a vehicle that can be used quickly to provide restitution, compensation, and, and all of that good stuff. And so essentially, I guess what we just wanted to call out is this is an opportunity and it's an invitation um, for everybody on this call who has an interest in potentially or ideas that you want to, you would like to test, you know, it's going to take us probably about six months to rebuild these two villages or the houses and other, and, and all of this stuff. So there's lots of room for help with things like um, planning, uh, urban planning, um, sustainability, environmentalism, new power systems, new water systems, you know, all of this type of stuff, as well as policy and and uh, guidance on best practices and this isn't just i mean it is hlp focused but there are already um you know there are war crimes and human rights abuses in these villages disappearances children that have been stolen from their families people who own businesses that disappeared on the first day of the war um and you know there's a there's a lot of different angles that we can test so just wanted to throw this out there. What I what I can do is this is a document that we've prepared. All of these links, for example, are live. I'm happy to share it with anybody on the call. Um, uh, you know, so I said I, I'll just drop my um, my email in the chat, and um, if anybody has any questions or wants to kind of potentially talk about how we can work together, what we can do to provide some real world results that you may be looking for, um, we're happy to do that. So thank you very much, Jim. Thanks, John. Thank you both. Um, did anyone have any uh, questions for Michael or John or comments? Okay, well, I'll, um, yes, if you do think of any, please do um, yeah, write them in the chat. Um, and also, I don't know if you guys, if you have, uh, if you start to have things, I don't know, on websites or available publicly, also feel free to to share share those things as well. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah website should be up by the end of the week and I'll send it out. Okay, great. Excellent. And we can share that within the, the newsletter as well for the AOR. So thanks for that. Yeah. And anyone who's got any yeah, questions, comments, please do, do uh, drop them in the chat or feel free to raise your hands. Um, Okay, thank you. Now I'm going to turn to um, uh, Loren, Lorena Nieto, who I think is with us. She certainly was earlier. Yes, there she is. Good. Um, who is going to um, give us a, an update and a bit of a presentation from work with uh, refugees from Venezuela as part of the uh, sort of protection uh, R4V platform. Um, please do introduce yourself better than that, uh, Lorena. I didn't do a very comprehensive job there, so please do go ahead. The floor is yours. Good morning, everyone, and good morning, Jim, for the invitation. Uh, my name is Lorena Nieto. I co-lead the Regional Protection Center for the R4B platform um, on behalf of UNHCR. HIAS is also in the co-leadership. However, they were not able to join this conversation. Um, this platform was activated by the Secretary General back in 2018. 
with the situation of the Venezuelan uh, crisis uh, across the region. Um, there are nine thematic sectors within this platform that gathers um, 200 organizations between UN agencies, NGOs, uh, civil society organizations. So what we do is basically co-lead the regional protection sector where we have uh, about 206 organization members. So what we wanted to share with you today was uh, the process that we have done on HLP related issues of refugees and migrants from Venezuela. I'm just going to uh, move to the next slide. Um, just to give you an idea of the situation in the region, what we have so far uh, by the end of November is a total of 7.13 refugees and migrants from Venezuela in the world, out of which almost 6 million are uh, in 17 countries of Latin America and the Caribbean. As you can see in the map, uh, most of them are in Colombia, followed by Peru and then Ecuador. Uh, but we also have some distribution across the different 17 countries that I have just mentioned. Back in the pandemic, when we started the process um, to see the, the impact on HLP related issues, uh, the evictions started to happen across the region. So what we did was a survey that included 1,021 households uh, in six different countries in the region. And that's when we started to see that the impact on HLP related issues was one of the key protection uh, issues that we needed to address. Uh, with the findings of the eviction survey, it was basically about uh, homelessness, um, other protection risks linked to forced recruitment situations are linked to organized um, crime. So uh, we decided that we needed to understand what the issue of property was for Venezuelans um, in their origin, in their country of origin. So that's when we decided to do a survey on abandoned houses and we focused in Colombia, Peru and Ecuador. The idea was to understand what the situation of um, tenure was in these countries, and this specific survey included 615 households. Um, we wanted to share some of the findings of this process. Basically, we found that 65% of uh, the households surveyed said they had abandoned their homes back in Venezuela, and 12% 12, uh, 12 of them considered that their homes were at risk of abandonment. Um, we also asked what the tenure was in the country of origin. And one of the key surprises for us was to see that most of them, most of the people that we were able to survey were um, owners. They had paid for their houses um, completely. So we had 68.8% of them who had completely paid their houses. We had 10% on possession. 7% were expressed that they were continuing to pay their houses uh, back in Venezuela. We also asked them how they had obtained their houses. 58% uh, of them said it had been through private purchases. 20% uh, had said they had inherited uh, these houses. And 13%, and this is really important, is that they had obtained their houses through this uh, social subsidy housing pro uh, program led by the government of Venezuela called La Misión Vivienda Venezuela. Um, we also wanted to understand uh, whether they had or not documents to, um, like, um, to confirm their ownership. 42% of them say they had titles notarized that showed they were the proprietaries of these houses. And 24% of them said they didn't have any documents. To, um, to show that they were the owners of these houses. Of course, within these 24% is where we know there are like, like uh, relevant risks of land grabbing, dispossession and so forth. Um, we also wanted to understand what the main impacts on living conditions had been of human mobility. So we compared the findings in terms of what they had in country of origin, where they lived in Venezuela and how they were living in host countries. So one of the key issues is that most of them used to live in Venezuela in houses, 70, 75%, and some of them lived in apartments, 14%, only 5% lived in rooms, and only 2.5% lived in improvised shelters. 
uh, the comparison with the situation in host countries showed that most of them, 49%, were living in houses and apartments. However, the amount of Venezuelans that were living only in rooms in overcrowdedness situation uh, was high, 35% of them. 10% of them are living in slums. Uh, 4 2% uh, are in improvised shelters, and we also found that 1 2% of them are homeless. It is likely that some of the ones that are right now in a homeless situation were also evicted when the pandemic situation uh, somehow exploded in the region. Um, we also wanted to understand what had changed between uh, this 65% of them being owners of their houses back in Venezuela and the situation they had now in host countries. We found that 91% of them were paying rent, uh, 28 were in possession, 2% had been able to pay some properties or were in the process of payment, 1.4 were loaning specific households, and then 1-2% uh, were uh, homeless, as I had expressed before. If you take a look at them at the distribution per country, you will see that um, what they what they what they are currently doing, like the higher percentages are, of course, linked to the situation of paying rent in host countries. When we ask them the costs and the responsibles for those who have been forced to abandon their houses back in Venezuela, 89% of them explained that they were forced to leave their houses due to lack of access to food and services, 73% uh, linked to the lack of uh, possibility to generate any sort of income. And then if you add what we found in terms of insecurity, generalized violence, threats, you will see that almost 46% of them were um, forced to leave their houses linked to situations uh, of uh, generalized violence or human rights violations. Um, the understanding of these households in terms of who caused this abandonment was 49% uh, linked to government entities, 27% to common crime, 14% uh, of them to criminal organizations present in country of origin. When we did the eviction survey, we found that there are some specific population groups that have been more affected both by evictions, but also uh, in the abandonment of houses. Uh, and this is something that uh, it's like it's sustained in both surveys. The first one is lactating women. In the case of abandoned houses was 15%. In the case of evictions was 20% followed by uh, medical condition and with access to treatment with 14% of them, 13% medical condition without access to treatment, and 13% people with disabilities. One of the findings that we uh, believe are really key is that when we did the evictions survey, only 3% of ethnic groups were affected by evictions. However, when we did the survey on abandoned houses, this uh, percentage grew to uh, um to sorry i'm comparing here to 13 percent of them um belonging to a specific ethnic groups um we also wanted to understand what the current situation of the abandoned dwelling was uh 83 percent of them expressed that their houses were occupied by third parties 38 percent said that um there were some specific interests on their houses by criminal groups or public entities. So the risk of dispossession is there. 19% um, of them said that they um, their houses have been sold, sold, I'm sorry, or uh, negotiated uh, by non-authorized third parties. 17% of them expressed that their houses have been destroyed and 5% five, five of them explained that they had some uh, non-payment of costs associated with the home they had left behind. Regarding who have caused the current situation of their dwellings, again, 49% are identified as part of government entities, 27% are third parties, it could be neighbors, family, or companies, 22% to uh, common crime, and 14% of them to illegal criminal organizations. Um, we also asked what they were planning to do. According to the situation, there is one key element, and this is uh, what has happened across the region with the pandemic. 
the economic crisis, the political crisis, the institutional crisis many of the countries in the region are facing. So the situation for Venezuelans who were on process of integration changed dramatically, as well as the security conditions they used to have before the pandemic. So uh, we found one key issue, which is also, um, it is like the, in the same line of what we found with the eviction survey, which is that many of them, most of them want to stay where they are. Maybe they want to change from one city to the other, uh, but most of them want to stay. So that implies that public policies and specific legal frameworks need to be adjusted to guarantee access to public policies on housing. 51% uh, of them, they are said they are not planning to return to Venezuela. As I said before, 42% of them plan to stay where they are. 25% are planning to move to a different place because they have faced threats, robbery, intimidation. 24% don't know what to do. And the last finding that was really important for us is that when we did the eviction zone survey, only 7% of them were planning to go back to Venezuela. However, in this survey on abandoned houses, that figure grew to 23% of them who are planning to return to Venezuela. This finding is really important because if we are learning from the previous um, slide that I shared that many of the properties has been, have been destroyed or are at risk of dispossession, what we will see is that if these refugees and migrants go back to Venezuela, they could be facing new cycles of violence that could, of course, create new situations of return um, of, I'm sorry, of displacement and human mobility. So we believe that uh, linking these to conclusions and recommendations, one of the key issues is first how to do the characterization uh, exercises to understand how people are. Most of us, most of, uh, of our priorities are to understand informal settings what the situation is, the profiles, the needs, whether they are being uh, able to access services or not. We know these population groups are the ones who are most exposed to uh, human trafficking and smuggling and other sorts of uh, risks. The both surveys showed that, of course, their con migration condition, their situation is most of them are irregular. They have not had access to regularization, so they don't have any documents. So the access to any alternatives or shelter um, or housing uh, are most of them informal, which implies that they are, of course, facing greater risks. So we believe that having these characterizations are, is really key. Second one, um, we need to have adjusted public policies and legal frameworks, both in host countries as well as country of origins to guarantee that HLP rights will be protected. Uh, and that, of course, following what we have found in both surveys that there are specific groups who are being most affected. We need to guarantee that local and national authorities will have some prioritization criteria to guarantee that those who are most exposed, more at risk, will be able to access a specific programs, subsidies to get new houses, to improve houses, um, and of course, the same situation back in country of origin. We believe, as Shusan presented, and you have already discussed, that eviction programs and the monitoring of eviction needs to continue, as well as the moratorium that was developed for the pandemic that, that has already ceased in many of the countries in the region. Um, there is one specific uh, need to map abandoned houses in country of origin, probably not the current situation uh, to move forward protection tools because it's not easy, but at least being able to register the situation and um, what people own will be key for future processes of restitution, compensation, or any sort of action linked to uh, return. Coordination between the protection sector and the protection cluster in Venezuela is key because we need to do the advocacy and all the design, the strategic response for uh, Venezuela that will continue in the region, in host countries, and are not planning to go back but also for those who are planning to go back or who are still in Venezuela and need to guarantee some level of protection on HLP. Community-based protection mitigation risk alternatives is one of the key issues that we have identified. Understanding that HLP rights is still a sensitive issue in the region and for most of the government, including the host country, the country of origin, sorry. And finally, 
the role and the developments in terms of mediation and conflict resolution and how the public ministry, the ombudsman offices can be more engaged into these processes to reduce uh, uh, risks. Uh, thank you for your time. I will leave it there. Uh, thank you, Jim. Over to you. Thanks, Lorena. Thanks so much for that. Really interesting to see that research and, and what it um, tells us about the, the context there and what's happening. Um, I suppose one obvious question is, you know, how do people access it? Would you be able to drop uh, the link in the chat if possible? Um, but yeah, thanks so much for that. I have a question I see on the chat from Alexandra. Um, he says, this is quite a fascinating study. Out of curiosity, did your survey identify whether the displaced peoples identified as indigenous? Yes, uh, that's one of the key issues that we saw between evictions and house uh, abandoned houses. Um, in evictions, we found only 1.3% of, uh, of people who had been evicted belonging to uh, indigenous groups. However, in this specific survey, that number grew to 23%. So we do know that there are indigenous and Afro-descendant communities that were included or identified in this survey that had lost their houses back in Venezuela. Um, since, of course, the understanding of ownership uh, for indigenous is more linked to collective titles and collective rights, this is something that we believe needs to be much more reviewed, understood, and analyzed to really grasp what's, what the situation is and see uh, how the protection of uh, collective rights needs, of course, to have a different uh, development and a strategy that at least in the region, we don't have besides what has been already developed uh, for Colombia. Thanks, Lorena. Um, any further questions or comments? Okay, great. Well, if you do think of anything, please do. And put those in the chat. Thank you, Lorena. That was uh, really interesting. And I see you've put the link there to that analysis. So yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Jim. You, you with us. Oh, Kat, hello. Sorry. Yeah. Um, just a question, maybe on on the maybe potent. What are the next steps, or what what is the protection cluster? How are you going to use the the results and the outcomes? What are you going to do with it? That would be great to hear. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Lorena. Thank you, Kat. There are like two fronts in which we are trying to move. The first one is linked to those refugees and migrants that will remain in the region. What we are trying to do is the advocacy. Uh, we have worked with the World Bank to meet with the different governments, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru, to share the findings and to do the advocacy to guarantee at least prior prioritization criteria with the findings of the survey. There are some programs that have already been designed, uh, for example, in the case of Bogota, which is the capital of Colombia. Uh, what the government is doing, the local government is doing, is developing a subsidies program that will um, identify families who own houses uh, and will ask them to rent these houses to Venezuelan families. And if they do for a period of two years, they will help them with a subsidy to guarantee that these families will be able to pay rent uh, and not having eviction situations. Of course, during the time of this subsidy, three months to six months, uh, the government will also help them identify job, education, health, other services, uh, but guaranteeing first that they will have a house to have their families placed. So um, the idea for us is first to identify these practices that have taken some space uh, across the region to promote the exchange of these uh, actions and also by joining the, the World Bank, what we are trying to do is to have the World Bank support governments with loans and other things to guarantee that this will happen. We understand that it's impossible to give houses to 6 million people in the region. What we tr are trying to guarantee is that some of them will have access and those who do will be able to do it under a specific prioritization criteria, not really whether they have documents or not, 
or whether they know how to move across entities because it's what usually happens. The ones that are able these are, are the ones who understand the system. And the, that leaves behind most of the cases are those who are most exposed. So that is what we are trying to do for host countries. In terms of uh, country of origin, we are trying to link with the protection cluster in Venezuela to share the findings. Uh, what we are proposing is to guarantee that at least next year, the identification of abandoned houses will uh, be will will start. What we did, for example, in Honduras, was that we didn't have the institutional moment capacity, political will, or anything to move towards protection. However, we understand that as long as uh, if we let time pass by, information will be lost. So we need to guarantee that at least we will be able to do maybe through church to community-based organizations the identification of abandoned houses, at least we will be able to have the record, is what we did also in Colombia back in 2004, when we started to identify abandoned houses with community networks. And then later on, almost 15 years after that, we had the restitution law, but we were able to say, we have all these registration, we have all these records just to start making the, uh, how do you say, like the, um, comparison between what you have on the official entity at what the community told us. And it's the same thing we did in Honduras. Some of the records worked, some of them didn't work, but they also showed us some of the houses in which we had already had some illegal transactions. So we were able to identify also land grabbing, dispossession strategies. So those are like the two fronts in which we are trying to, to work right now, Pat. Thanks, Lorena. Um, over to Alex and then to Jamal and then we're back. Uh, it's okay. Um, let Jamal go first. Okay, sure. Jamal? Yes, thank you very much for that, um, Alex. Um, so, Lorena, let me first of all congratulate yourself and your team for the exceptional work um, that has been done in this regard. And it's quite interesting that, that this topic um, has come up today. I think the, 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 the subject of, of um, bridging the evidence gap on tenure security has arisen no less than five times, substantively. So over the course of the past five hours for me, um, from, different, from different sources, and it's really interesting to see that you would have raised it today as well. And I think the convergence is quite telling of the importance of this particular subject matter. Um, I think it is worth noting that EGRIS, um, that's the expert group on, on statistics for refugees, IDPs, and stateless persons, um, is meeting today um, for reflection um, on progress made where bridging the evidence gap for enforced displacement is concerned. And I think one of the subject matters on the agenda is um, the disaggregation of 12 SDG indicators um, by forced displacement. And one of those indicators happens to be indicator 1.4.2, which is on tenure security. So I think that within itself is quite telling. So what I'm, I'm keen on learning is a bit more about the methodology. Of course, we don't have the time here, but we can have that bilateral, of course, whereby I can learn a bit more um, about the methodology that has been employed in this particular case, because I think that there is potentially an opportunity for scaling a model here in really addressing that evidence gap around tenure security and land governance more broadly. Um, so, so, of course, I, I really welcome that bilateral, so we can perhaps exchange email addresses in that regard. Thank you very much. And job Thanks, well done Jamal. again. Thanks, Jamal. Yeah, and, and Lorena, maybe um, a brief comment on that. And also, um, Joseph asked in the chat as well, you know, interesting to see these kind of surveys conducted more and wondering about the resources that was uh, required to conduct it. Uh, so maybe a brief comment on the sort of method and the resources. Um, yeah, Lorena. I believe that the first thing that I would say is that um, Basically, what we did was to find the resources to hire someone to help us analyze the findings. That's where we put money. And it was basically 15,000 for the evictions process and 30,000 for the abandoned houses process. The rest, the, the data collection was done basically thank you to, thanks to uh, NGOs. 
we had the support of Save Children, NRC, DRC, uh, who through their teams in the different countries were able to uh, share with us the, the colleagues they had for collection data. So what we did is uh, we developed the survey, we prepared, we trained all the, um, the uh, interviewers. So what we used was the people they had in call centers, the colleagues they had going to shelters for, to make uh, assistance deliverance, uh, and we also trained people they had in their own offices providing services. So what we did is that we uh, negotiated like a window of time, two weeks, three weeks, we trained all of them, we shared uh, the surveys, and they just gathered the information. So if without the help of the NGOs, we wouldn't be able to do this because we were not paying anyone, any of the interviewers, because we didn't have the money. So it was just advocacy, and I believe that NGOs found that the findings of the reports were useful for them for uh, strategic purposes to develop adjust their programs. And of course, because they were seeing that these specific issues were relevant for what they were finding in the field. So if I add up the 30,000 and the 15,000, we are talking about uh, 45,000. The rest uh, was more about communication pieces, but it's a whole different issue because for the technical purposes of both studies, we just uh, used 45,000 for the consultant. That's basically what we did in terms of resources. And in terms of uh, methodology, Jamal, yes, um, just a quick, uh, quick reference to when we started to develop the survey, the questionnaire for the abandoned houses, what we did was to like a deep analysis of how the Venezuelan property law was built to understand the categories, how tenure was developed in Venezuela, how it had changed with this specific government. And then we did a document comparing different socialist um, regimes across the globe to understand how property was placed there and how the situation of ownership was interpreted. We also compared restitution processes between this specific sort of regimes to um, guarantee that we were approaching the questions when we asked the Venezuelans whether they own a house or not, they were understanding specifically what the concept was in the development of the Venezuelan law. So just in terms of a concept and how we approach to guarantee that we were not talking about different things and we will have like a this sort of analysis, that's basically what we did, but we can continue, of course, on a bilateral uh, Shannon Jamal. Thank you. Thanks, Lorena. Alex, did you want to come in briefly? Yes, sorry about that before. My sorry. computer was about to die, so <laughs> it's easier to pass the, uh, the word to somebody else. Uh, Lorena, this is such a really fascinating study and what you were talking about, about the pilot project with uh, the local municipalities going to provide subsidies to property owners to rent their units is also quite amazing. Um, that pilot project, what, what's the scale that it's being planned at right now and sort of what, what's the horizon for uh, implementing it? What the, may, like the uh, local authority told us uh, is that they're going to do this pilot with 500 households um, initially, and this is what the World Bank is supporting as a pilot. Uh, at the same time, the World Bank is um, giving a loan to the housing ministry at the national level with a program that it's called, uh, how do you say, Semilleros? Um, well, like an like a owner's bank. So what they are trying to do is to have at the local level this pilot on um, subsidies for rent. And at the national level, they are going to prioritize 250 families to see whether they can help them to become proprietaries. So I guess what they are trying to do is to compare the renting situation and then the access to property and see in the comparison between the families, what is more useful and what can be placed better in local and national uh, public policies. So this is what they are going to implement next year. Right now they are in the designing phase but the project has been approved by the World Bank um, for these 500 at the local and 250 at the national. I guess we will have 
initial findings of this maybe one year from now and see whether it works or not. That's extraordinary. Um, I'd love to follow up with you a bit more on that, but uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thank you, Lorena. Thanks, Alex, for that as well. Um, okay, so firstly, thanks for staying with us a few minutes over. It's been super interesting. Um, I want to just open up just for a couple of minutes. If anyone would like to give an update to the meeting, um, we're recording, so uh, we can place this on the on the uh, the uh, GPC, the Protection Clusters YouTube channel, and share links. So. If you would like to update and have that uh, recorded for posterity, or if you have resources to share as well, please let me know. But yeah, let's, um, if anyone would like to share an update with the group um, on what they're doing, please, please do. Yes, Joseph, please come in. Hi, yeah, just a uh, very brief. So in uh, USA, we're looking at having a uh, HLP uh forum humanitarian hlv forum uh, there are several on this call i can see uh, who've been involved in prior discussions um if anyone here is interested just let us know this is a, this is obviously not in competition with this group it's just a discussion trying to bring together actors primarily based in uh, united states interested in housing and in property in humanitarian states um humanitarian settings so if anyone's interested um, give me a call. I see many other people here. I can see Alex. I can see Lee. Um, I can see. Uh, so it's uh, let us know. We're just trying to form an informal group uh, and maybe some kind of forum early next year. Thanks. Thanks, Joseph. And it's a good way to get involved with a group where the uh, meeting times will be uh, guaranteed to be uh, uh, sociable and and uh, good and not either too early or too late. Um, yeah. <laughs> Anyone else want to share a brief uh, brief update before we finish? Okay, well, in that case, um, it leaves me to say thank you so much for all our presenters. Fantastic to hear from uh, from uh, Shazan from Somalia, from Ibere and Ombreta, and also from John and Michael and Lorena and all of you for your questions and comments. Very much appreciated. Um, so thank you for that. We'll be sharing um, minutes and uh, uh, you know, presentations where they're available and a recording of this in the coming days. And um, yeah, also the links that have been posted in the chat, so I'll share as well with you as well. So we'll meet again next year. Um, and uh, until then, wish you very, very uh, good end of year and to look forward to um, yeah, keeping in touch next year. And if anyone would like to present on their work, um, please do let me know and uh, we will be able to yeah, factor that in and uh, work out when to do that. Um, but yes, thanks so much for being with us and uh, see you soon. Cheers, bye-bye. Thanks everybody, Merry Christmas. All right, thanks Jim, thanks colleagues, all the best. Yeah, thank you very much Jim for that one. It's a wonderful time. You're welcome, thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you Jim, it has been great. Nice to have you with us. Thank you.